Do you want me to call her? Yusra, are you there still? We got um, 10 seconds. Yusra? these groups come from, I do not know. They're not even hiding their white nationalism in those protests anymore. People are leaving this province for a reason. So people don't want to come to this province and particularly minority groups won't want to come as they hear more and more about this. To see these incidents happening reinforces that stereotype. We are scaring people off or people don't want to come here. She would come into the building and continue to yell at me in the building. The reason we need to come together as all of these different communities and strive for change is so that the people who are causing these hate crimes realize that it's wrong. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Attacks against Muslim girls, rising hate crimes against black and Asian communities, and the shocking images of tiki torch carrying protesters and symbols of hate marching through our streets. We often hear, this is not my city, this is not Alberta. But it's becoming more common, more visible, and this is the reality for Wild Rose Country, for many black, indigenous, and people of color facing racism. I'm Crystal Adarius. Joining me on AB Branded by Hate is Black Lives Matter YYC President Sidora Norfor, Teresa Wupa from Act to End Racism, and Yusra Joma. Uh, who spoke recently with City News after assaults on hijabi women and girls. First, thank you all for taking their time today. I want to start off with that phrase, not my city or this is not my province. How do you BIPOC community members respond to this, especially in Alberta? Adora, uh, let's start with you first. Um, I'm a comedian and I begin my set with I'm born, raised, and still living the racism dream in Calgary. So this is not new. It's been happening. And if not in your city, then where? No BIPOC person should be living or thriving or surviving racial trauma. So it doesn't belong anywhere. And it is definitely in Calgary and Alberta. And quite frankly, it's not stopping and we're not doing enough. Uh, next, let's go to Yusra. What are your thoughts on that when people say, you know, this is not the, the province I know? It's not the city, it's not the province, nor is it the country, nor is it the planet that's permissible for anyone to, to judge or, or to apply hate upon anyone. Um, this planet belongs to me, like it belongs to you. This province belongs to me, and it belongs to you. This this country, the city, the town, the community, the hamlet belongs to me as it belongs to you. I have a right to live, provide for my family, make my earnings, love my neighbors, have street parties, and enjoy each other. This is coming along where um, these minorities think it's okay. Sweetheart, it's not. It's not okay at all, period, end of story. Response? Uh, Teresa, your response, uh, um, the idea is we often hear, um, this is not my city, this is not my province. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, as you said, the head tax, um, uh, it's, and it's the Chinese Exclusion Act and the, and the Chinese head tax, uh, in fact, uh, when I uh, ran my first um, election uh, for school board trustee, uh, and I won, and uh, someone actually um, took the effort to write me a letter to call me the young hero. So, unfortunately, I think I know it too well. That the racism has always been part of Canada and our province and our city. I have been involved in cross-cultural uh, diversity, inclusion, uh, anti-racism for decades in the city. 
I have seen lots of ups and downs in terms of our organizational commitment to the work, and I think it is very obvious. Uh, I think the um, that some of those efforts have come and gone, and we really require sustained, integrated approach to addressing systemic racism in our city and our province. There's been a disturbing attack recently. The victims, just girls. Police are pursuing hate crime charges after one was assaulted and had her hijab torn at Princess Island Park. Here's a look at just some of the incidents that grabbed headlines. Do you even know what you guys are doing? I had a great grandfather that fought in the Second World War against the Nazis. So. It's really hard for me to understand how people could be so glib. Suspects started the physical assault by pushing one of the victims before hits to the girl's face and stomach. If I was her and on the ground with my hijab off, I'm probably humiliated. And as soon as I wanted to open my mouth to talk, I just heard at least three or four voices said my name, Umi Do, is a mother Like, you brought the China virus over, go back to your own country. So she was telling me that I'm going to F you up. Uh, so of those snippets, I'll just point out just a couple of them were just from one weekend a couple of weeks ago in Calgary. Um, you, sir, let's go to you first. Are members of your community feeling a chill in the city? And I noticed you just kind of like nodding your head, just, just going through hearing some of those experiences. Tell me, um, how are community members feeling? I'm going to speak on behalf of many cities uh, across the province. Uh, there's beyond a chill. You have to understand that for me, this is my identity. This is who I am. I'm a beautiful Muslim woman, modest, humble. I wear a hijab. I go out identifying who I am. I am Muslim. I am not only me, there's hundreds of me. So for those who think it's, it's a piece of cloth or for example, I'm going to go to the park where these two girls were walking in the park. Um, hundreds of people were walking in that park. I choose those two because they were walking away, ignoring you, not giving you the benefit of the doubt. And the other person had enough. So she grabs her hijab and rips it off. It speaks to hundreds of women across the country that go grocery shopping, putting their grocery carts away, getting spat on, telling them, go back to the country you came from or go back where you came from. I come from planet Earth. I don't know where you come from, but I come from planet Earth. It belongs to you and it belongs to me. Where do I come from? Where do I go? And when I go, what do I take with me? I don't take anything with me when I'm six feet under. I take respect. I take being honorable. I take tolerance. I take love, unconditional love. If it's not okay for you to see my hijab, I said this before and I'll say it again. It's, okay. it's not okay for me to walk outside with my hijab. But if I walk outside without my pants, what will happen then? Mm -hmm. and, and just to follow up to that, Yusura, because I, um, as a hijabi woman, um, there's no hiding your faith. It's always, no. and does, it, does that mean that it could always make you a target? Always, always. So you be the bigger person, you rise. Um, Islam teaches me to forgive. It teaches me to love. It teaches me to honor. And like the, like, I'm going to take example. These two girls were respecting whoever this person was, but they were walking away, ignoring her. Same with me. You can talk. You can say you can do whatever. You're uneducated. Go back. You're oppressed. Who said I was oppressed? Who said I was uneducated? Who said I can't speak English? So it hurts me as a hijabi woman. This is my identity. Hello, I'm here to stay. Respect me and honor me. Let's go to Teresa next. How is the Chinese and Asian uh, community kind of feeling in the city lately? People being shouted at, pushed at, beaten, and shot by virtue of one skin color, ethnicity, and race. Of course, it creates a sense of insecurity, being unsafe. But after a year of heightened anti Asian racism, heightened because it has always been there, or living in perpetual fear. So the community 
feel the pain and share the grief and with those who experience hate and racism. So I think that it's one million Canadians of Asian descent, and I, like a few million uh, other Canadians, are living in fear. I'm worried for my elderly parents. I'm worried for my children who are, who are out there working. I'm worried for my friends, other women being targeted. So this should not be acceptable in a country like Adora, we'll go to you next. What is, is the feel, feeling amongst uh, your community um, just seeing the rise in some of these hate incidents? Well, the black community is really the target at all times. And I want to remind people that hijabi people are black and Asian people can also be mixed with black. And if we don't start talking and fixing anti-blackness, these things are going to continue. So for my community, we're not surprised. Uh, we are tired. We don't want to see people continuing to be harmed, uh, traumatized, and living in violence or fear. We consistently are trying to send the message that racism is not okay, oppression is not okay. And we really want to just get a break so that we can live our lives however we want to. It's not because people think that we are good enough or that we're kind or we're doing what they like. Because we exist, we deserve respect and kindness and care and support and to be able to live our lives however we decide and then we should face whatever consequences come with actually doing something that's harmful and that's not what's happening for us and quite frankly people of privilege are getting away with murder they're getting away with harm they're getting away with making communities feel like they are not useful and that cannot happen ever so we often see after hate incidents politicians public figures coming out and condemning the actions here's a look at some municipal and provincial politicians and some of their responses in the last year they came here to pick a fight with our law enforcement. They came here uh, to pick a fight with counter protesters. They came here to pick a fight with Edmontonians. And we stood there and largely shook our heads. Video first seen on City News of an anti racism protester being punched in Red Deer Sunday. I would not tolerate this as our justice minister. Where the heck these groups come from, I do not know. They're not even hiding their white nationalism in those protests anymore. It's not at all about masks. Right now, I'm actually focused on making sure that junior hockey gets back up on its feet again. Obviously, obviously, white supremacy, white supremacy and racism is never, ever tolerated. So what support uh, do you guys want to see from politicians, policymakers, the police? Uh, let's go to our former cabinet minister first, Teresa. Well, thank you. Um, our political leaders and public protective entities are here to serve a diverse citizen. Canada has acknowledged the increasing racial diversity uh, in our country in the 80s. And Calgary is now the third most, most racial diversity in the country for some time. So it's obviously problematic if our systems are only 65 to 70 percent of the population. We are all taxpayers, we are Calgarians, and we are Canadians. So words are important. I look for acknowledgement from our elected officials, but action is what counts. So we have to be more adequately served, protected, heard, and included by any other Canadians. And Teresa, just a follow up, because that is just a snippet of what we heard from different politicians. But how of, would you respond? What would you do as far as is it publicly condemning something? Is it uh, looking at uh, some policy changes? How would you respond to hateful incidents and, and, and rallies and symbols of hate in Alberta? 
Um, I think that um, certainly uh, if I were a public uh, office, uh, uh, officer right now, uh, I would actually come up every time there's a, a critical incident because people need uh, assurance and uh, definitely need to look at the uh, policies and programs. And uh, so um, uh, I think that we, some of the things we can look at is uh, actually banning hate symbols, uh, take a critical look at our hate crime to make it enforceable because we know it's not right now. Then look at what systems, are, uh, well, are some of the barriers that are better in our system that really needs fixing right now. And uh, work with the community to find solutions would work for the impact of communities. So I think that uh, we, we need to address uh, systemic change with a greater sense of urgency because underrepresentation of racial identity in our system, we don't often see that sense of urgency. This is the time to act. Thank you, Teresa. We'll go to Adora now. What do you want to see as far as a response from politicians, policymakers, and the police? I really want to thank Teresa for talking about urgency because when it's around the economy, the change happens tomorrow. And what has been happening is that those of us who are surviving racial trauma have been doing it so well, it seems like it's okay. It's not. We need the change yesterday. We also need politicians and people of privilege to understand that they are in a place of comfort right now where they have authority. If you have authority, you're not really experiencing these hate uh, crimes and uh, violence and racism the same way that you are if you don't have any power. So the people who should be heard the most are the people who don't have power. And we are not seeing that. Very often the people who are influencing policy and change are people who are in comfort. <laughs> and it's not happening fast enough. We're, people are dying, people are losing hope, and this is not the way that we hear that Canada is running. Canada is truly not doing enough when it's around racism, and um, people like myself who are speaking out on a regular basis are being punished for it. Uh, we need to defund the police. We need to put money back into our communities. We need to support people who are marginalized and opp oppressed on so many levels. Uh, and we have not even started that process. Yusra, let's go to you now. Same question. What do you want to see from politicians and policymakers and the justice system? Um, policymakers, uh, justice system, the justice system has to take a look at an event, for example, really quickly, these, uh, these young girls in the park, I don't know who they are, I don't know how old they are, but the million dollar question is they're avoiding the perpetrator, they're walking away from her, so when they were ignoring her, enough is enough, she went after them. What happens if one of these girls were pregnant? What would have happened then? Why, why did this person wait for this particular group of girls? Politicians, you are my voice. You're the voice of hundreds of women across this country. Canada has always been known for peacekeeping. It's always been known for love. Politician, you are my voice. I sent you an email. I spoke to you. I said to you, this is gonna, this is what's happening. How many letters do you need to receive from me to take it to your party to say we have an issue in Canada? This participant, I am her voice. She is Muslim. She's wearing a hijab. She was in the grocery store picking out frozen juices. And this person came up to me and says, go back to the country you came from or go back to where you came from. I looked at her and I said, where? My mom's womb? That's where I came from. Where? Planet Earth? That's where I came from. So politicians have to understand that this topic is happening all the time. There's many topics across this beautiful country that have to be addressed. But in order to reduce crime, to reduce hate, we have to deal with it. It's not we'll put it on the platform on our next election. There's no time for that. How much more hurt 
that someone has to get to before politicians do that. I think the police are doing the best they can within certain parameters what they're permitted doing. But when they hear me, when I talk to them, why didn't they listen to my voice? They haven't said, okay, we have a person, this is what's happening. You have to wait until I'm hurt. You have to wait until I'm shot in order for things to be done. That's got to be taken a little bit further. There's, there's so much I can say in this little, little tiny time frame, but politicians, um, lawmakers, Justice Department, I'm not going to go to court for a reason to defend myself for being hurt and kicked and my hijab ripped off, my identity ripped off. You've taken my right to exist. For what reason? There is no reason. So punishment is at the doorstep, I feel and I believe, and I think it should be done. So. Thank you, Yusra. Um, Alberta is trending online sometimes, and it could be for all the wrong reasons. For instance, violence at a rally in Red Deer went viral. And that could be reinforcing stereotypes of what it's like in Wild Rose country. We spoke with activists and community leaders about how this will impact the province. People are leaving this province for a reason. So people don't want to come to this province and particularly minority groups won't want to come as they hear more and more about this. To see these incidents happening reinforces the, that stereotype somewhat, right? That this isn't a safe place for people who aren't um, white settlers. You don't have to be a critical thinker to understand the absurdity of comparing public health measures in the midst of a global pandemic to the systematic murder of six million Jews. The Alberta government says that all of our growth will come from international immigration going forward, which fundamentally means that if we are scaring people off or people don't want to come here, we simply won't be able to grow, and that's a very serious concern. Adora, I'm wondering first uh, to you um, if you have any insight as to what image this gives Alberta. And for those in your community within the province, you know, are there talks about, you know, this is not a good place to be to raise kids and I don't know how much longer they want to stay here? Uh, in the black community, it's definitely a conversation that people are having and they don't want to be part of the greater Calgary community. And that's unfortunate because we have so much to give and add anywhere we live and grow. Uh, there is not real opportunities for us within the economy, politics, uh, or just even volunteering in our communities, to be honest, unless it is Black-led already. And there's no support. Calgary wants to be an international city. We cannot do so with only white people. Calgary needs every kind of person here. We're already diverse. We didn't become diverse. I'm born here. They're not doing anti-racism. It's a glow up. It's the glow up you need. Anti-racism is freedom. So for me, I feel like this city is moving backwards. We're not developing at the rate that we could have been. We know that as a community, Calgary can work together to overcome anything. We've seen it time and time again, but they're not doing that for racism. Anti-racism is not a virus, it's a choice. So to misconstrue that with people's health and freedom, no. People choosing their health is freedom. The economy cannot grow without people. So bring on all the people who can make this place more amazing. The world has been led by white men for a long time and it's pretty fantastic. Let everybody else have an opportunity. I'm telling you that this country, this earth that we're on, <laughs> it will truly be radiating all over <laughs> because all we're doing now is abusing the earth, abusing our communities, ourselves, and we really need healing on so many levels. Calgary is not doing that uh, and it's showing. 
Young people are leaving here. Young people do not want to come here. Our schools are showing that youth cannot manage what's happening around racism and around oppression. So what is happening with our next generation? Our next generation it all the time is protesting about how the oppressions are really harming them and they're not developing in the way that they want to, the way that they deserve, the way that uh, humans should be able to express their humanity and develop through their humanity. So Calgary, you get a failing grade. Alberta, you get a failing grade you are not going to become the next place that could really develop people and community. We have so much great stuff in this city, in Alberta, and people are going to miss it because racism is what we're serving up first. Yusra, let's go to you first, because you're joining us from High River. I know your family has deep roots in northern Alberta, uh, but tell me what are community members saying about the province and whether it's, you know, uh, a place they want to live or if they want to leave? Well, um, I'm going to speak on behalf of many that have spoken to me, so no one wants to leave. They've made their homestead, whether it's northern Alberta, Cold Lake, Slave Lake, Edmonton, High River, Okotoks, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat. This is home. So you spent your, you immigrated to Canada and your dad lived, let's say, for example, in Drayton Valley or Hinton, and that's just the family grows in that community. So do they want to leave? Where do they go to? BC, start all over again? No, this is the homestead. This is where they planted their feet and their roots, their businesses, their work, um, et cetera. I think what has to happen is that this is where I live. This is where I have. I want Alberta to thrive. Alberta is a beautiful province. It has everything that we ask for. But unfortunately, whether economically or through certain circumstances with racism, it, oh, because it's Alberta. Why is it? Because it's Alberta. So if I'm going to refinance my home, because it's Alberta, it's only 65% loan to value. Why? Why? Why don't we stand up together as a collective, where races, businesses, all of us together, every single person that has a voice, young and old, whether in schools, in work, what are we experiencing in our province? Why do these people want to move away? Where is the hurt that's not being addressed? Where is that torture when you go to bed at night and you put your head on your pillow and you keep reliving the fact that I was yelled at, I was screamed at, I was told to go back where I came from. You've got the blanket over your head and it's in your mind playing over and over and over again. Who do I talk to? I am exhausted because I keep telling you guys nobody is listening. Things have to happen. We have to, we have, it's not a fix. We have to work together to put policies in place that there's zero tolerance, zero. Whether I'm Asian, I'm Black, uh, I'm Chinese, I'm Hungarian, it doesn't what matter what I am. I am human, and I swear that I cut my hand, I bleed red like everyone else. This province is my province. This is where my bread and butter is from. I'm not leaving, I'm not going anywhere. You can't push me to go outside this province. What we, what we must do is take a look at exactly how hurt am I? What has happened? Has my business been affected as a business owner? If you witnessed, if you witnessed a white person screaming and yelling at a black lady, why? Why? As a business owner, why didn't I approach and say there's no tolerance for this? Sorry, what can I do? And be the mediator between A and B. There's none of that. I think people are are afraid to speak out. They're afraid of speaking the truth, so they're shunned. And um, but it's not right. I'm not leaving Alberta. Alberta is my home. I love Alberta. Um, I came to I came to Alberta. I was one month old. I was born June 1st. I arrived July 1st. I've been in Alberta forever. I don't think other provinces have felt my footsteps on it yet, but I'm, I'm an Alberta girl. I am an Alberta girl. I live by its rules. I work by its rules. I go home and live happily by its rules. I enjoy Alberta, 
not leaving, not leaving. You can't push me out, can't push me out. But there has to be that address to a very, very, very angry person to go, to go away or go back to the country you came from or go back home. This is home. This is home. Oh, you can't speak English. Oh, I speak English better than you do. Oh, you're uneducated, says who? So there's those types of degrees that I'm upset but is it going to have me or someone else, unless they're being transferred by work to another province to, to push me out of, out of Alberta? No, no, it's not happening here. Teresa, now, are we attracting people or driving people away? Well, um, this is my 49th year, um, you know, uh, as an Albertan, and, uh, and I have uh, had the privilege to experience some of the, the opportunities province of the office. But I think with the um, I think the hate and racism that have been uh, here uh, and um, also being reminded with the escalating violence, I believe that our province reputation can be at risk and, uh, and I would hate to see it So I think that uh, we really need to have our public institutions uh, and our public officials uh, take your action uh, in a very timely way, uh, really listen and engage and work with the impact community so that we can be the province that we aspire to. Uh, one is that that is uh, inclusive, uh, offer opportunity for So I think that we have work to do. Uh, I think that we should consider potential um, mutational risk seriously and, uh, and do our very best to respond in a timely manner. We're nearing a year since the death of George Floyd, and we're just now watching the trial unfold for the officer charged with counts of murder in his death. This sparked massive protests and inner reflection on how many of us contributed or were complicit with racism. But activists in this next clip are watching to make sure is it an, that it isn't just all performative. <laughs> And it's starting to really come to a head. And so the reason we need to come together as all of these different communities and strive for change is so that the people who are causing these hate crimes realize that it's wrong. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't There's a lot of folks who, who are posting it and not actively doing the work or have actively aggressed like folks who are of color who worked for them. We, we had a meeting about it actually, and we said we're gonna see who sticks around after we ain't trending no more. This is something indigenous people have been talking about for decades, and I don't know what it's gonna take for people to see their role in um, going after racists, going after sexism. Adora, uh, let's just go to you first. Um, is it the time now to not just read and listen to BIPOC people, to do more, to say more, to take action? Anti-racism is a practice. That means that it's a habit. You have to do it every day. Every moment of every day, racism is impacting me and affecting me. So that means that to end racism, it, Somebody needs to be working on it all the time. I'm consistently interrupting racism and I'm punished for it. And I know that it makes many people uncomfortable, but if we want to move forward, we got to do that work. So every day you need to show up for people who are oppressed, whether you understand it or don't. You will be fine if you make a mistake. Racism doesn't kill people who are racist. Racists don't die because somebody calls them racist. Quite frankly, it's the other way around. I call somebody a racist and I'm being punished and people die because of that. We've seen with George Floyd, he was murdered. So every day people need to practice supporting black people, indigenous people, people of color, educating themselves, update anything that you think you already know and then put it into practice. It means that if you see something happening, you have to say it. Don't call the police on black people. Stop that. That's not helping us. You need to make sure that the black people in your life know that you support them. 
that means tell them. That means show up and ask what you can do. If they don't say it, it's probably because they don't really feel comfortable. Offer what you have. Continue to offer what you have. Find your friends and make sure that they are doing the same. Anti-racism is the glow up that you need. Once you figure out that you're being oppressive, to really live your life without harming people is a gift. It's a blessing. You get more out of life when you are not being nefarious and harming people. Adora, I've got to people skip People will respect to... you more. They'll help you more. Or Adora, sorry, I've got to skip to you, Teresa now as we're running out of time. We've seen um, an increase in anti-Asian racism. And one of the things that I heard is, you know, during one of these events that a person I talked to was attacked, nobody did anything. Are allies taking enough action? Well, I think like Adora said, I think that we all need to uh, be, become better allies. And we start by learning uh, ourselves and help other people. Uh, you know, I know that a lot of people want to hear the impacted community speak, but they are the disempowered ones. They are the ones feeling threatened right now. But we need everybody to speak against hate and racism. And uh, we need to be better allies, and uh, we need to be active bystanders. Because most of the time when hate and racism happen, it happened to a targeted person or family. But there are lots of people standing by that can actually do something. And I think that we all need to learn to you know, good advice and, and good bystanders. Uh, even though I, I, um, I, 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 I'm not one of those people who love to protest, but I was there last year, and I'm over 60, to support the, the black people in, in, in our community. I think that we actually have to take a dance time. Sura, we just have about uh, 30 seconds left, but if you can tell me if you're seeing enough from allies, if they're taking enough action. No, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, those in uniform step up. Uh, those who see um, um, a, a person minority in trouble, be the hero, approach them and help them out. Be the hero. That's the change. It starts with helping. It's saying, hey, breaking, go away. Walk away. Walk away. Thank you. We're about to out of time. I want to thank our guests again for joining us. Yusura Joma, Adora Nuofor, President of Black Lives Matter YYC, and Teresa Wupa, Chair of ACT Foundation and ACT to End Racism. This conversation and our stories on racism only scratch the surface of the topic that's uncomfortable and forces people to look at themselves, their household, and their communities. You can find all our continuing coverage on 660citynews.com. And City News is tonight at 6 and 11. Thanks for joining us.